heartened by what I've heard you say uh, to Senator Inhofe and Senator Fisher about um, our nuclear triad and our nuclear strategic deterrent, um, and with Senator Fisher in particular about the ground based strategic deterrent replacement for the Minuteman three. I do want to uh, get a little more specific about that because it's 50 years old and we've seen problems with structural fatigue and water intrusion and decayed wiring. The GAO has warned that we could lose confidence in the fleet by 2026, a mere five years from now. Congress has fully funded the GBSD, its replacement system, and both military and civilian leaders have consistently warned that the service life extension of the Minuteman three is no longer an option. Um, given that we have, until recent years, put off nuclear modernization for so long, the threats rising with China's crash nuclear buildup and Russia's unconstrained tactical weapon inventory, Dr. Hicks, I want to know if you will fully commit to, deploy, to the deployment of the GVSD on its planned schedule. Senator, I'll say again that I believe the triad has been a bedrock for American security, and I am a, a big believer in the value of the nuclear deterrent. W what I can't say today and until uh, I have an opportunity, if I'm confirmed, to get in and understand the state, just as you are describing the, the, the state of the various legs of the triad, in this case, uh, the state of the land-based component, it's difficult for me to um, assess exactly what the timeline and the margin, if you will, is, and also the technical feasibility issues, not just resource issues, but technical feasibility issues. Uh, but what I can promise is I am committed to a modernized, um, qualitatively um, effective deterrent. And if confirmed, I'd be happy to work with members here on uh, uh, a discussion around what we're seeing and what those timelines look like and making sure that the FY22 budget um, pushes forward uh, the president's commitment to that nuclear deterrent at the same time that it's promoting America's uh, nonproliferation agenda. Um, that commitment uh, to the deterrent includes the ground-based leg of deterrent, correct? Yes, Senator. I believe that our deterrent is strongest as a triad. I, I understand that there will be a relook, as there is in every administration, at uh, the various aspects of nuclear policy and modernization. I think that's appropriate. The Trump administration did that as well. Um, but if, if you're asking my personal view, my view is that the uh, we are the triad has served us very well. It has created stability, and it has a value. And uh, I can understand your hesitation to make the commitment of the deployment on time, given the Pentagon's long history of many programs running over time and over budget. Um, so let's divide the reasons uh, in half why you wouldn't make that commitment. One is the policy reason that some in the administration, some of the Democratic Party, don't want to modernize uh, the missile leg of triad. And then there's all the concerns about, as you say, the technical feasibility, where the program is, its financing, and so forth. Is it the second concern that you have that uh, causes you to hesitate towards making commitment towards on-time delivery as opposed to the first, the ideological or the policy one? Senator, as a, a nominee for Deputy Secretary of Defense, I, I probably think myself mostly in the former category in general. Yes, I would be very much focused on the viability of the programming element of this, and I would be in support of the Secretary, of course, on the major policy issues um, regarding nuclear posture, where he seeks my advice. But as I, as I said in my opening statement, I think my job is to make sure we can execute on the President's um, direction and on Secretary Austin's direction. Okay. Well, what, uh, if confirmed, I certainly hope that'll be a very top priority to make sure all those programmatic uh, issues um, permit for the on-time deployment of something critical to our national security. Dr. Hicks, you suggested something in your answer that I want to touch on as well um, about a posture review. Will the Biden administration conduct a nuclear posture review as has been the custom for the last several pre new presidential administrations? Uh, Senator Cotton, that is my understanding. I, I I don't, because I'm not inside the administration, I don't know uh, the status of that, but it is my understanding that there is an intention to review nuclear posture as well as, of course, overall defense strategy. The latter part is a congressionally mandated requirement. Thank you. One final question. Like all administrations in the nuclear age to include the Obama administration, will the uh, Biden administration decline to adopt a no first use policy for nuclear weapons? 
Senator, I can't speak to uh, how the Biden administration might ultimately come through its policy assessments um, with regard to either nuclear declaratory policy or other issues. Um, I have been on the record in the past as not being, uh, I, I don't believe new, uh, no first use policy is, is necessarily in the best interest of the United States, but those will be decisions ultimately made, of course, by the president. Well, well thank, thank you. you. I hope you'll be a vocal uh, voice for that and that people will listen to you. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Now, via WebEx, Senator Gillibrand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you so much, uh, Doctor, for being here. Um, I want to continue along the line of argument that I listened to from Senator Blumenthal, um, and uh, you did say that you've reviewed the Fort Hood investigative report. Um, in that report, there was a significant recommendation, um, and it said that uh, commander negligence at Fort Hood fostered a culture of violent crime, sexual assault, and harassment. The inve investigators pr provided a solution, quote, to ensure objectivity and fairness, the sexual harassment assault response or SHARP program should operate independent from local commands and their legal advisors. Uh, Dr. Hicks, uh, do you think that if local commanders are not trusted to oversee SHARP, that they should still get to decide which sexual assaults and complex criminal cases should go forward to be prosecuted? Senator Gillibrand, let me just first thank you for your leadership in general on this issue. As the Fort Hood report makes very clear, even just in the one excerpt you've given, this is an, a problem that doesn't appear to be um, getting any better. Um, and we need to be really open, I think, on the solutions, the levers that will actually make a difference. Um, I am not uh, a legal expert. I, I can't speak to the specifics of how the department at this point, you know, without being in the department, how the department ought to move forward on those recommendations and in particular on the accountability side. Um, prosecution and accountability side. But what I can say is that to the extent that Secretary Austin um, uh, is uh, involving me in decisions relating to countering sexual assault and harassment in the military, that I'm very open to ideas, even if they include um, removing uh, the commander from, from that uh, uh, prosecution chain. Mm -hmm. Um, and the purpose of that would be to give the prosecution to trained military prosecutors who have had time to develop expertise in criminal law, because right now fewer cases are proceeding to trial and fewer cases are ending in conviction. And so as a result, we've seen a lessening of people's faith in the system. And the one recommendation that survivors and uh, legal expert and advocates have recommended is allowing the professionalization of the prosecution of major crimes uh, that have um, jail time of more than a year. And so that's why this is the recommendation. And for your benefit, we've put forward pretty much every other recommendation that the DOD has supported and turned it into law, and they have not changed these outcomes. Um, and the second thing that doesn't seem to matter is whether a Secretary of Defense takes this seriously or not, because every single one of them has said they've taken it seriously from Dick Cheney on. And so promises, uh, empty promises are something that I hope the Biden administration does not tolerate. And I would like your commitment that you will really focus on this issue to make sure that we get to the right result where we can have a military justice system that is worthy of the sacrifices that the men and the women in our services make every single day. Senator, you have that commitment. Okay. Um, I'd like to address now issues of cybersecurity. Last month, it came to light that Russia had created a backdoor into computers of at least 250 agencies for nine months and possibly still, they've been able to monitor computer activity and steal data that has come uh, to our attention. So um, a private company, FireEye, brought that to our attention, not the DOD. This comes only after two years that our cyber posture review found that we've had difficulties with DOD cyberspace operations ability to prevent malign activity from our adversaries. Now we've had several hearings on this and we've had lots of proposed changes. 
One proposal is to increase the role of the National Guard so that cybersecurity experts can maintain their day jobs while also serving the country. Do you think this is a tool that could be useful for this problem? Senator, I think the National Guard can bring um, uh, specialized capabilities in exactly these types of areas where the commercial sector, to your point about FireEye, where the commercial sector is sometimes out in front of the federal government. So it, it does seem to be at first glance that the National Guard could be helpful in this area. Uh, last, last, I wanted, wanted to touch on diversity. Uh, recently, the DOD released a 2017 survey that showed 24.4% of active duty minority service members experienced harassment or discrimination, but only 26% reported their experience to the Equal Opportunity Program. Only 16% of reports led to punishment of the perpetrator and 10% somehow led to punishment of the reporter. While interviewing um, Anthony Brown last July, you stated the military is a quote, engine to counter racism. With statistics like this, do you think that engine is actually working? And would you agree that service members should have the same ability to report discrimination without reprisal as a civilian DOD employee? Senator, I, I hesitate to get into specific recommendations related to UCMJ or, or other legal matters. If confirmed, I would absolutely want to speak to the career lawyers um, to understand what the implications are. But to your general point, I think it is crystal clear that the military has not ta undertaken sufficient efforts on diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and that we have a major leadership challenge, quite frankly. We have a problem on the prevention side, and we clearly have a problem on holding uh, folks accountable, whether it's sexual harassment and assault or mm -hmm. it's um, DEI-related issues more broadly. And I am committed to making sure we make genuine progress. I know it's difficult to hear nominee after nominee come up and say that, but you have my commitment and I would look forward to working with you on both sets of the, both of these sets of issues. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Gillibrand. And uh, via WebEx, Senator Rounds. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Hicks, thank you for your years of service um, and, and the work that you've done in, in uh, national security issues. Uh, I want to thank you for your willingness to serve once again in such uh, an important position. I enjoyed our phone call last week, and uh, I want you to know that I intend to support your nomination. I do have a couple of questions that I'd like to go through with you specifically with regard to our our DOD cyber strategy, um, which had been published back in December of 2018, which charges the DOD to defend the forward, shape the day-to-day -day competition, and prepare for war. The United States Cyber Command has demonstrated successful instances of defend forward in securing the 2018 and 2020 elections. What are your views on the defend forward, shape the day-to-day -day competition, and prepare for war concepts? to deter and disrupt Russia and China in cyberspace. Senator, first, thank you very much for your, um, uh, your support of my nomination. Um, I have had an opportunity at, at different periods in the last several years to get a little more information uh, on what's behind Defend Forward. I would say, based on the um, briefings that I have had, I am supportive of the approach um, I think if confirmed, what I would like to understand better is exactly how the authorities um, are being executed, what kind of oversight is involved, how we are consulting with allies and partners, um, whose systems we might operate on. I think those are very important uh, questions for civilian policymakers to be engaged on. But in general, I believe that we have had to become um, much more forward-leaning in our approach. And I also think Congress has a uh, critical role to play here in terms of authorities. And I would want to understand better, again, how it's being executed today to engage in a dialogue about what is the appropriate role for Congress and for civilian uh, policymakers in the executive branch. I'm also very pleased by the progress that we've made enabling Cybercom to rapidly conduct cyber effects operations to include offensive cyber operations. Can you tell the American people why this is so important to our national defense? I think it's important that the public understand 
that that uh, we've got challenges with people attacking us, but we have to be in a position to offer offensive cyber operations, even when we're not in an identified conflict. Yes, Senator, I think one of the major challenges about thinking through uh, competition or, or confrontations in cyberspace is that the classic definitions of what is offense and what, what is defense are very blurred. Um, and so it is challenging to use the kind of constructs we've thought of uh, in the terrestrial sense in cyberspace. What I would say to your point is the way in which adversaries can come at our systems and the recent Russian hacks to include through solar winds demonstrated this is they can live in our systems for some time. They can undertake espionage, extract information, and then can um, turn um, in many cases onto what we would think of as offensive approaches. In order for the US to, to prevent that and deter that, it also sometimes has to defend forward. That is to say, it has to be um, living in systems so that it has the warning, the intelli indicators and warning um, to know that an attack is imminent. And that's where this offensive piece becomes important. Exactly, and, and not only that, but it also provides us with advance warning about the types of tactics that might very well be used because if they're using those tactics in other countries in advance, they may very well be using the same tactics when it comes to trying to get into our systems as well. But as we discussed during our call, there was an effort in the last administration to end the Cybercom NSA dual hat. Again, I've been watching this issue for a number of years now, and I'm really concerned by that. I had originally come in thinking that it, and it would be appropriate to split them up uh, rather quickly. I changed my mind. I think that the dual hat with the unity of command it provides is working very well for the current and likely for uh, future Cybercom commanders. Now separating the two organizations could create some real problems with regard to the assets that uh, would have to be acquired in addition to what we have today. Would you please share your thoughts on this with the committee? Senator, I don't have a position on the ultimate disposition of the dual hat arrangement for Cybercom and NSA. Um, I do have an assessment based on um, my work on the transition team looking at where we are today, and particularly in light of this recent hack that included exploitation of the solar winds um, uh, software. And that is that we are not a, at a maturation point now with Cybercom that makes the dual uh, hat arrange an end to the dual hat arrangement wise in the immediate. Um, and if confirmed, I would be happy to continue, of course, looking at this issue and giving Secretary Austin my, my best advice on, um, you know, if there comes a point where that does seem to be, the split does seem to be wise. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rounds. Now, via WebEx, uh, Senator Irono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Dr. Hicks. Thank you for um, chatting with me the other day. I start with the following two questions of every nominee who comes before any of the committees on which I sit. First question, since you became an adult, have you ever made unwanted requests or sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? No. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement related to this kind of conduct? No. I note in your responses to the questions from my colleagues that you recognize the importance of the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. And that includes the importance of the compacts that we have with the freely associated states of Micronesia, Palau, and Marshall Islands. I believe that we can do more in our partnerships with them. And I hope that you will be open to, for example, Palau has asked us to invest in joint use uh, facilities such as uh, airfields and, um, uh, well, air airfields. So I hope that you'll be open to doing more with our important partners in the Pacific. Senator, I am open to that. I do applaud Secretary Austin's recent announcement that the Pentagon will prioritize climate change considerations in its activities. 
uh, risk assessments and in the next national defense strategy. I believe that renewable energy is not simply an environmental calculation, but it is becoming a tactical necessity for the DOD, which is the biggest user of energy in our, in our um, government. So uh, we have included provisions in NDAA to prioritize energy security and resilience at military installations. And uh, I'd like to know whether you will make energy resilience and mission uh, resilience and mission assurance a priority for the DOD. Yes, Senator. I think uh, the resiliency aspects on uh, climate are critical as a business proposition for DOD, uh, again, focused really, if you just take a hard-nosed resource, look at it. Um, and I, I wanna commend Congress for reestablishing the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Installations and Environment. Um, if confirmed, I would work with Senator Austin, excuse me, Secretary Austin, to ensure that we uh, put forward a nominee who's uh, very capable and competent in these, in these exact spaces. I think the issue of energy uh, resilience and uh, all of that is uh, we have to stay the course. Uh, Senator Shaheen had asked you about the importance of our shipyards and she said it's a parochial concern, but it is not. It's, a, it's I view it as a national concern. And of course I chatted with you about the importance of the four public shipyards of which there is one in Hawaii. And so the modernization of these shipyards uh, is a very important concern for uh, a number of us. And I hope that uh, I have your commitment that you will continue to support the funding for the modernization of our shipyards. Because it's, as you acknowledge, it's not enough to just build ships. We actually have to repair and maintain them. Yes, I agree completely, uh, Senator. The, the sustainability of, of all of our forces, frankly, especially if you look at where the cost curves are on operations and sustainment, um, that's gonna be vital if we're gonna compete effectively in the future. Senator Blumenthal and Jill Brand have asked you questions about the continuing scourge of sexual assault harassment, and I would include retaliation on the basis of uh, reporting somebody who reports these uh, kinds of actions. And it continues to be a scourge, as I mentioned, and every secretary, every deputy, everybody who comes before us from DOD says that you will, you will do something about it. So I'd like to know, you know, what would be uh, measures of progress in this area? How would you determine whether real progress is being made to uh, eliminate or, or reduce the scourge of sexual assault, harassment, and retaliation? Senator, I think first, one of the most important uh, tools we could have is transparency and data. And I, as you are likely aware, uh, the department has not collected uh, recent data with regard to um, reporting on sexual harassment um, or um, we have, we know how many um, uh, claims, if you will, have been made, but we don't know the totality of the reporting. If you look again at the Fort Hood report, if you look at that microcosm of the Fort Hood community, um, it was very clear, it was significant underreporting um, underway. And so I think that's an area we'd want to look at right away in terms of uh, making clear that reporting does not have uh, negative consequences for the career of anyone in the total force, civilians, contractors, or military. Um, and that there are, are tools, easy tools, hotlines that are easy to use that everyone knows about, that the training is there. Um, and then I would just add sort of the, the, the training element. A lot of these um, harassment, harassment is often the grooming process toward assault. Uh, so we have yes. to look at both of those issues. And a lot of this is happening in the, the youngest of our service members. And that, that means there's training opportunities. That means there's leadership opportunities at every uh, level. And we need to be making sure we're holding folks accountable at the same time we're putting the resources into prevention. But that's why it's important to have sexual harassment as a separate charge in these matters. And maybe another way to determine the extent of the problem is to poll your service members themselves as to whether they have experienced uh, sexual harassment, assault, et cetera, including, by the way, asking them about um, racial discrimination. I believe my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Rono. Now, the... Um... Webex, Senator Tillis. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Dr. Hicks. Thank you for uh, being there. I want to also thank you for being so generous with your time on the phone call last week. We covered a number of different topics. Uh, I did want to get back to some of the discussion we had last week, particularly around the, um, on the one hand, I, I like all the, the responses you've given to my colleagues on commitment to modernization and uh, our defense strategy. On the other hand, I think we're going to come up uh, with funding issues and challenges to keep those programs on track. So how do we, uh, when you go into this role, and I intend to support your confirmation, how do you look at getting more productivity out of the dollars we already have in the face of, uh, of the economic challenges that we have, and maybe an administration that wouldn't place the same priority on funding that you've seen over the last four years? How do you get more productivity? What kind of uh, wide programs do you think are appropriate to drive more productivity for the dollars being spent? First, Senator, thank you so much for um, your statement of support, and I enjoyed our conversation as well. Um, let me let me tackle a few aspects of that because it's a very it's it's not an easy answer. I, I think some of the elements are about tying co the capabilities, the programs to capabilities to concepts to what we're trying to achieve, and that concept to capability link has been weak in the department for some time. Again, the department has some work underway. If confirmed, I'd wanna get in, um, in particular, talk to the vice chairman and the joint chiefs of staff about the status of that effort um, and try to understand where the concepts are driving us to ideas about how we perform in the field against challengers. That helps us really focus the mind on the priorities we need to have um, in terms of what deters effectively, what creates credible capability, um, and also, um, you know, where are there areas that are lower risk? There's never a lack of risk. The question is how to prioritize effectively and be transparent about where we have decided to take risk so that Congress, among others, can, can make its own determinations about those uh, judgments. I think the other thing I would just point to is the business operations side of DOD. I mentioned in my opening statement that that's an area the deputy secretary, of course, needs to be involved directly in. And it's in, in large part for the reason you point out, which is we have to make every dollar that the taxpayer puts in have a return. And that return should be measured in terms of joint capability. So that means we need to squeeze out um, uh, obviously abuse, but much more frequently we see waste. Um, and that will be an, a priority for me. Um, thank you, Dr. Hicks. I think I mentioned to you on the, on the uh, call that we had that if I were there in person, I'd be bringing my 600 page plus RFP for the next generation handgun. Um, I think that that's a case study in an acquisition process gone wrong. So I, I have the bias that what we have to do is go in and stratify some of these acquisition processes that are literally preventing some viable suppliers from even participating because they're so costly and so time consuming that uh, we could get a richer supply base. I think if we get smarter on certain systems, clearly on more complex uh, leading edge technologies, it may take time, but I think all of them have to have an up and down review. Um, Dr. Hex, I also just want to go back and associate myself with uh, some of the comments made by Senator Blumenthal and Senator Gillibrand on military sexual assault. I suspect that that's going to be a priority in her position as chair of the personnel subcommittee. And I'm very frustrated with uh, some of the confidence that I've placed in, uh, in the department to make progress and not seeing the kind of progress. And, uh, and the, I think uh, the foot, Fort Hood review uh, says a lot needs to be acted on. The uh, final question I have for you is just your assessment of our uh, NATO relationship and our partners. Uh, what challenges or what can we build on based on the uh, prior administration? Senator, I think the U.S. transatlantic relationship manifested most fully in, in NATO. Um, in the military sphere is is absolutely vital to any of the challenges we think of in the future. Uh, even when we think about China as the pacing challenge, our relations with our European allies 
is critical to our effectiveness, our ability to build out a community of democracies that can counter authoritarian um, approaches. So I see NATO as a, a, as a centerpiece of our alliance networks throughout, throughout the world. Um, I, I have been concerned, I have um, uh, written on my concern that the focus on burden sharing, and we should always be focused on burden sharing, ensuring that allies um, fulfill their commitments, but that when it becomes that tactical issue, it overrides the strategic value of the alliances, alliances that the Chinese and Russians could only hope to match. Um, we have uh, been, if we get to that point, we have become a strategic. And I'm very hopeful that President Biden, who has spoken eloquently on this issue, um, will make good progress in returning strategy to the center of our alliance relations. Thank you, Alex. I look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Uh, Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Dr. Hicks. Congratulations on your nomination. A couple of topics. First on uh, sexual assault in the military. When we grappled with this issue in a major way in 2013, and we've sort of been building upon that since, there were basically three categories of SASC members. There were those who felt this problem was so serious that the only solution to it was to remove it from the chain of command. There were those who felt that the problem was deeply serious and we needed to make the chain of command work to solve it. Um, and then there was a third group into which I, Senator King, some others around the table were in this group. We knew it was serious. We wanted to give the chain of, the, of command an opportunity to solve it. But if we were unhappy with results, we were very willing to go the path of taking out of the chain of command. I just sort of want to put on the record that that third group of members of this committee, virtually all of us are really unhappy with the progress since 2013. We're now getting to eight years from then. And we were willing to give the chain of command new tools, new resources, new accountability mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we're not happy with the outcome. And so I think it's just important for the Pentagon community to know that that was sort of a swing block in 2013 that led us to go down a particular path. But many of us who were supporting those um, within the chain of command improvements have been very dissatisfied with the results. And we're now very open to, to pursuing a different path as we said we would at the time. That's number one. Uh, number two. Here's an accomplishment that is a, an Obama and Trump era accomplishment that's also an accomplishment of this committee and the Pentagon. Pressure for the Pentagon finally to do an audit, like every other federal agency, and to have every function of the Pentagon and every part of the Pentagon audited. We did that because an audit is a good oversight tool for this committee. Um, an audit is a good accounting tool for the numbers folks at the Pentagon. But we also did it because an audit should be a good management tool for folks like you. Tell this committee how you will use the audit in your role should you be confirmed. Thank you, Senator. My understanding um, from uh, the team that's in the Defense Department based on my work on transition is that the audit in fact has been useful as a tool of transparency, getting the data um, up and shared and known first of all, points directions to some of these business process improvements that we can have. But then even operationally, it's had the effect of revealing inventory, excess inventory, things of that sort, um, that, that not only, again, is efficient, but gets real capability out to the field, spare parts that exist in inventory that are needed in the field, but we didn't know we had them. Um, so the audit has revealed some of those very basic approaches, as you say, that, that every, every business um, has to um, abide by and is advantaged by. I think it is also pointed more generally to the value of data. And as we move into an era of data, um, the department needs to move there too. And the audit is showing the way to how data can be leveraged to make more sound analytic decisions. I hope you'll continue that focus. Any, any dollar or energy we spend on something unnecessary or ineffective is, is a dollar that we're not spending on these real challenges we have before us. Last question is this. Um, 
there are positions still to be named in the Biden administration under secretaries of defense for acquisition and sustainment and research and engineering. Many of the nominees and appointments for DOD spots thus far are veterans of the Obama administration, local think tanks, advocacy groups, all of which is important, but none thus far have extensive acquisition or industry experience. Uh, the department was well served, in my opinion, by some previous officials like secretaries Lord Gertz McCarthy, who had sizable acquisition experience before their appointments. Um, if confirmed, do you have any sense of where the department will look to fill up the ranks of the ANS and RE uh, portfolios so that we'll have acquisition and research expertise in a, a Biden Pentagon? Senator, um, Secretary Austin, when he was nominee, Austin and I spoke quite a bit about those particular positions. And then, of course, you have the, the service acquisition executives who have in, uh, increased responsibilities in, the, in these areas. Um, and I know from Secretary Austin, this is among his highest priorities in terms of um, positions to fill in the near term. Um, I, I can't speak on his behalf about the particulars of, of individuals, but I can tell you that the attributes I know uh, uh, that the department needs um, is that acquisition expertise, is a, familiar, a, f a familiarity with um, the hardware and software ends of where the department's capabilities are coming from and uh, a really uh, fine-tuned sense of how to work in new ways with industry to some of the issues that, that have already been raised. Uh, new, there are significant challenges to non-traditional defense players getting into the marketplace. We need to lower those if we're gonna compete successfully. Thank, thank you, Dr. Hicks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kane. Uh, Senator Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Dr. Hicks. Congratulations on your nomination and appreciated the opportunity to chat uh, the other day and um, really, uh, sorry, I'm looking at my, my time here. Um, appreci appreciate uh, your background 